Pastor Johnson, when you are doing it, I love you. My bosom friend. Only God can relate to you. To you, Pastor Nancy. Give to every one of you. I thank you. I have my reasons. Only God can reward you. For those of you that are listening to me on Zoom, prayer line, Facebook live, I wait for what God has laid prepare for you. Your expectations will not be cut short in Jesus' name. Please have a majestic seat. Brothers and sisters, to stand here, to stand on this pulpit, to be given the opportunity to share the pulpit of a great man of God is no mean feat. I do not, I do not under any circumstance call myself or put myself in a pedestal to be able to match or even equal the greatness of the servant of the living God, the pastor of this church. However, however, I know it is not of himself. It is only through the Holy Spirit of God. And I believe and I lay myself down and bring myself under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit of God that he will speak through me and I will be a vessel unto honor, an oracle of the living God. And this is my portion, and yours as well, in Jesus Christ's name we are praying. Amen. 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 Now, our topic today is going to be faith in the time of distress. Faith in the time of distress. It's interesting that we are going into our prayer conference, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, right? Yes. When I look back on those on that on that period, uh, when I look back to the last prayer conference we had, which was December 11, 12, and 13, uh-huh. by the unction of the Holy Spirit, the the speakers of those day of those days were your my humble self on Friday. Pastor Sean John on Saturday and Pastor Mrs. Dolly on Sunday. So I found it interesting that this particular time which we are having our own pre-prayer conference three weeks ago, we reversed it. It was Pastor Dolly. When she told us and taught us that God in his own triune state is our helper always. Pastor Dolly anchored her teaching on 1 Samuel chapter 23 and told us that the absolute importance of believing or having faith in the Holy Spirit's willingness to help us always. God is there forever and ever and ever, ever help, ever ready help in time of trouble. That was what? Three weeks ago. Lo and behold, last week. The great pastor Sean George, our very own PSG, talked about having faith, firm, resolute belief to make change in our life. She painstakingly explained to us that faith is employing what is in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 to 6 and proceeded to teach us on how to activate and use the faith to effect change in the various situations that occur to us in our lives. So today, by the helping of the Holy Spirit, we are about to have faith, firm, resolute belief 
in a time or in times of distress. So, I'm going to use Pastor Sean George's different teachings, and I'm going to build on that. First, let us remind ourselves of the first definition of faith, as vividly explained in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because, as I said, PSG did it last week. All right? So, if you are not here to go and go on Facebook Live or YouTube and watch it. All right? And, 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 and you will see what, how he literally broke it down to the nitty gritty. But I'm specifically looking at verses 1 and verse 6. Verse 1, verse 1 says, defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? I go, and I'll go down to verse 6, because that is where I am more, I am look, I'm focusing on. It says, but without faith, Without faith, without resolute belief, without firm assurance, it is impossible to please him. Why is that? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let me repeat that. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. As a matter of fact, the Amplified Version of the Bible defines faith, and I am paraphrasing here, as the title deed confirmation. Let me repeat. The title deed confirmation of divinely guaranteed things and the conviction of the reality or the comprehension of facts that cannot be experienced by the physically or the physical five senses. So even science recognizes the fact that beyond the five senses that we know, sight, ears, taste, yes, touch, and smell, there is still something beyond that. We now know that to be what? Faith. It goes on in verse 6 to say that without faith, it is impossible to come near. Impossible to come near or to walk with God. Neither is it possible for you to please God. I'm talking of the amplified version of that of, of verse 6. Why? Because if you want to come near, if you want to walk or please God, you must first believe you must first have faith that he exists. The interesting thing is, you are sitting down here, you are watching me, there is no doubt about that. Otherwise, you won't be doing that. So we know, we hold, we hold it sacrosanct that you believe. You literally have faith. But in addition, you must have an ironclad, title deed, resolute confirmation that God rewards those who diligently seek him. Yeah. Mark my word, they must be ironclad. It's title deed. It, it, a title deed is your property. And it says it is in rem. It is a power in rem. It is against anybody and everybody. It is against the world. Your title deed is for yours against the world. So it is an ironclad title deed, a resolute confirmation that God rewards those who diligently seek him, those who diligently seek his thoughts, those who diligently seek his will, those who diligently seek what? His purpose, his reason, and accept his timing. That is what we get in verse 6. So we are talking about what? Faith in the time of distress. I'm looking at the time and I know we will make it. Amen. Now if you have ever been under the preaching 
of my mentor. You will be familiar with the words of three Bible passages. Job chapter 14, verse 16, Psalms 34, verse 19, and James 1, verse 2. And the passages, those three passages, make us realize or affirms that every man born of a woman is born for trouble. It also tells you that the level of your righteousness begets the level of your affliction. Which runs contrary to what, what we were told when they said we should accept Jesus Christ, right? They said, accept Jesus Christ. It will be all good. Everything will be hunky dory. As you pray, it will be answered to you. You have no problem. What you, you claim it, you receive it. But every man born of a woman is born for trouble. The level of your righteousness will determine the level of your, of, 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 of your tribulation. When the devil notices that you are building yourself and becoming a general in the kingdom of God, then he starts bringing things to you. That's the truth. And also that we, we will have diverse, diverse and multiple temptations, diverse and multiple trials, and multiple tribulations. The three verses that I've mentioned to you, Job chapter 14 verse 6, Psalm 34 verse 19, and James 1 verse 2. Put all those things together. So, if these times of distress and these times of troubles are certainly going to happen, so how do we cope in those times? How do we manage and handle those situations? What are the vessels or the weapons for us to be able to maneuver within those circumstances and those hurdles that are put in front of us? How do we keep on ticking when life gives you the icky? Especially when the licking comes suddenly. When life throws you a curveball from nowhere. How do you handle faith? In the time of distress. Permit me the indulgence to introduce you to someone who faced one of those situations, one of such situations. And what is is more concerning, what is more disturbing, what is more uh, um, amazing, all right, not in a good way, is that even the prophet in the land at that point in time, did not know that was coming. I'm talking of the Shunammite woman that is referred to in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, this heroine in the Bible was rewarded for her faithfulness to God and to the prophet Elisha. All right? They gave, the, the, the God gave her a son. The one thing she wanted, God gave it to her. Or they would not want it. The one thing she needed, because she did not want anything. A rich woman, comfortable, doing her thing. Her husband was faithful. We saw nothing. According to the, the Bible says to us that she told Elisha, I don't need any food. But Elisha said, well, you may think you don't need anything, but I know what you need. You need a son. By this time next year, you will have a baby. And it's going to be a son. A son. Baby boy grows up. He's a young lad. He loves his father. Goes with his father to the farm. He does what he wants to do. Uh, I can imagine a precocious between 10 and 12 year old boy doing whatever he wants to do. <laughs> and according to verse 20, which is up right now, it says, when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on a knee till noon and then died. Baby boy 
guys. The heir of promise dies. A calamity of epic proportions. The reward has become the reproach. Because we will no longer know her as the Shunammite woman. We, know, we will now know her as the woman that her son died. died. The reward has become the reproach. A source of massive distress. A blindsiding blow. And what is more profound is if we flip on to verse 24. <laughs> you will find out that even the prophet was spellbound. Verse 24 says, oh, no, go on to, I believe, 25, 26. 26, good. All right, he said, run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. But verse 27 says, Then when she came to the man of God to be healed, she caught him by the feet, but Gehizi came near and thrust her away. And the man of God said, Leave her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. Here is the proof. And the Lord had hid it from me and had not told me. So her rock Prophet Elisha has faltered because he himself did not see the stress that was coming into her life. But if, she, if he had known, he would have told her, please don't send him to, don't send him to the field on that day. He's going to have heat stroke. Oh. Just like if he had known, if he, say, he, say if the man of God had known, he would have called you and said, don't go to work on that day. Do you know how many people would have wanted their pastor to call them on September 11, 2019 and said to them, on this day, if you don't even go on to L.I. Don't go near the city. But the Lord had hidden from the pastors, from their leader. What to give? What do you do when you, when you are faced with such distress. As many of you are aware, six weeks ago, on this very day, I lost my sister to the cold, cruel hands of death. And I was devastated. I still am. Life threw me a curveball. And, and you wonder why. When we look um, when we look amongst us, Dodger is the fittest. Dodger doesn't doesn't cost her anything. Dodger got a clean bill of health as at the end of last year when she was leaving South Africa to go back to Nigeria. Where did this come? Where did the lady I saw on the 23rd day of April with her children singing to me happy birthday over video conference turn up dead August 8th? I tried to search for myself. I am still trying to search. But God knows best. However, one morning a couple of weeks ago, I, 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 I was mopping the floor in the basement. So I mopped the floor and I threw it inside the mop bucket. But because I was pressed for time to go back, to go to work, I left the water there. When I'm talking of dirty, murky, stinking water, 
I'm talking of this. This. This was brown. In fact, it was black. It stunk. It was rotten. Ew. But I didn't. I couldn't throw it out. I had to rush. So I left it. Folks, will you believe it that the next morning, when I came across that water, that bucket, to my utter amazement, it was crystal clear. Crystal clear. All that murkiness, all that dirt, went down to the bottom. Went down to the bottom. Now, of course, science tells me that if you drink that, you're done for. But when looking at it, looking at it, it looked like a portable drinking water. And then I felt in my spirit. I felt deep down in my spirit. I literally heard the following word. This is what happens when my children stand still. Hold their peace and let me do Give it some time and it will become crystal clear. In other words, no matter how murky or stressful the situation, hold your peace. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Says, stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Give it time, and the Lord will surely show up at the right and, more importantly, the appointed time. If you have the NLT version of the Bible, Join me in Psalms chapter 34, verse 19. Yeah. One of the three verses I mentioned about. Psalm 34, verse 19, NLT. Says, and I quote, The righteous faces many, many troubles, but the Lord comes to his rescue each and every time. KJV says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of all of them all. The Lord, NLC says, the Lord comes to his rescue each time. No matter the trouble, God is there. No matter the situation, God is there. Hold your peace. Give it some time. You will see God in action. Brothers and sisters, today, I call on you to have faith in the time of distress. I call on you to have resolute belief and a title deed conviction plus confirmation that God will surely come to your rescue. No matter what life throws at you, your confession and your word will be like those of our heroine in 2 Kings chapter 4, 23 and 26. It is well. Regardless of the situation, your response is, should be, it is well. In other words, you lose your job. It is is well. Your spouse leaves you. It is well. Somebody cheats you. Death comes knocking at the Have 
have been, it is well with you. Remember, this is the substance of the things we hope for. These include, but not and are not limited to, the ease and the eradication of our distress. We hope for these things. It is the substance of things hoped for, including the ease and eventual eradication of those stressful times, of those troubles, and the evidence of the unseen, including double honors for your trouble. The evidence of the fact that God will give you double for your trouble. Finally, finally, I will ask you all to remember the words of that wonderful faith building hymn. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll upon me, whatever be my lot, thou God has taught me to say, well with my soul. Verse 2 says, even though Satan will buffet me, and when my trials come, because they will come, Father in heaven, let this blessed assurance control my heart that Christ Jesus as regarded how helpless my state of being is, and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. Brothers and sisters, that's the end of my sermon today. My prayer for everyone under the voice of my of under my voice right now is this that you look back and you know and you have implicit and resolute faith that we serve a living and a loving God who has promised you and I that I will never leave nor forsake you that even though a nursing mother can forsake that child he, God, will never forsake you. He is there in the midst of trouble. And he has told you, he has said, peace be still. Stand still and watch and watch out for the salvation of God. May the Lord let his reading and the blessings of his word be activated and live in your life and my life now and forevermore. In Jesus Christ's name we are prayed. Amen. Amen.